Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. James Wanamaker. I am the chair of the New Dentist Committee. Uh, tonight, we have our third success series on financial planning. Having solid financial footing is essential to your first few years in practice as a new dentist. Tonight, we're going to be talking about both the offensive side of financial planning, like refinancing student loans, cash flow, paying down debt, as well as the defensive side of protecting your future net worth with insurance. A few housekeeping details. Uh, if you are interested in getting the CE credit for tonight, please make sure you change your name uh, on your profile for Zoom to your full name, um, not just uh, the initials or abbreviations, if you'd like to get credit. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them throughout. Uh, you can put them in the chat box and our speakers will answer them as they come in or at the end, depending on how they fall into their presentations. I'd like to introduce our three speakers for tonight. Up first, we have Ben Lake. He is a senior financial advisor for Altfest Personal Wealth Management. Ben works with clients and their families to develop and execute financial plans designed to achieve their financial goals. He also implements and monitors investment portfolios tailored to clients' goals and risk tolerance. Then we have Alex Maselek. He is the business director for Laurel Road. He has over 10 years of experience in the student loan industry and has helped thousands of borrowers determine their optimal repayment strategies. Alex has a degree in economics and finance from Bentley University. And then wrapping us up, we'll have Gina Goodrow. She is the second vice president of specialty insurance markets for Protective Life Insurance Company, which administers the ADA members insurance plans issued by Great West Life and Annuity Insurance Company. Exclusively available to ADA members, these insurance plans include life, disability, income protection, office overhead, expense, and supplemental medical. And I will turn it over to Ben to kick us off. Thanks very much, James. Uh, and thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, like James said, we're here to talk about a, a wide range of topics related to uh, your finances and getting things started uh, in the best way possible as you all start your careers, progress through them, and work towards your longer term goals. Um, I have a few slides. I'm going to share them momentarily here. Uh, but as I pull them up, um, let me give a, a bit of a brief background on um, what we do at Altfest. Uh, we are a comprehensive wealth management firm, uh, which means that we basically cover pretty much any service and topic uh, related to our clients' finances. Uh, certainly, a lot of it is focused on things like investment management um, and comprehensive financial planning, which covers a wide range of topics um, shown on this uh, first slide here, uh, things ranging from cash flow and goal planning, prioritizing um, you know, where your, each of your dollars go, uh, tax planning, making sure your taxes are organized, um, student debt management, uh, career transitions, and progressing towards longer term goals like starting a family or, or buying a home or retiring. Um, and, and what we do is we look at this as a very holistic picture and try to put together uh, kind of a series of plans, recommendations, and all of the intent of this uh, is to help people uh, take you know, the steps necessary, create a path towards achieving a variety of goals that they have for their life and for their finances, uh, really in the most optimal way possible. And you know, I personally work with uh, a very good team here. I've helped develop um, kind of a lot of our financial planning uh, processes specifically designed for young professionals. Uh, and young dentists, and it certainly can be applied in different ways to people in different situations. And so our you know, firm's history working with uh, NISDA and dentists uh, certainly is something I'm hoping to kind of share uh, uh, some insights on tonight. I think one thing that we very commonly hear uh, from people in the profession is that um, they tend to think of things very linearly, very logically, which can definitely make sense. Um, you know, when it comes to your finances, many people often kind of come to us and say, well, my plan is to start by kicking out my student debt. And then once I pay that off uh, or have it forgiven, you know, then I'll think about starting a family and buying a home. And then, you know, after that's done, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to start my own practice or become a partner in a broader practice. And then at some point after that, I'll start saving for retirement uh, once my income's high enough uh, and then retire. Um, and the tricky part about, you know, that kind of linear process when it comes to your finances is that by the time you get to some of those later goals, uh, it can often be a pretty short time frame that's left, or a pretty uphill battle to try to meet them all. And so what we you know, often do is start to have conversations about, well, let's think about this uh, in a more strategic manner uh, and try to think about what we can do to start now 
towards working towards both these shorter term, you know, more immediate goals, those medium and long term goals as well, uh, and see if that helps you get there again in a more kind of confident and uh, optimal fashion, hopefully much sooner. And when we start to go through that kind of analysis, you know, explain and illustrate the benefits of that, people kind of start to realize, yeah, that's, you're absolutely right, that you know, starting some things early, even if you know, you know, it might feel like a, a, a burden or a struggle or something that's a challenge at the moment, um, really does have that longer term payoff over time. And I would encourage everyone to kind of think of their finances as a, a very holistic part of your life. And certainly it can be, you know, in some ways exciting, uh, you know, saving for the future, building towards, you know, a successful career and a happy life uh, is extremely important. Some things, of course, can be stressful. You know, I know from working with many people that, you know, things like student debt, which you're going to hear more from momentarily, is often a source of, you know, concern um, and it can feel like, you know, a weight at, at the beginning. Um, but just kind of, you know, even, even if you're not working with a professional, if you're looking at this on your own, looking at it as kind of a step-by-step -step process of here are some of the immediate steps that I can take towards, um, you know, again, achieving these longer term goals, making progress uh, and reducing that stress and all of that, putting, being able to put it together will help you kind of have a, a more confident sense that there's a path forward uh, and that you'll be able to, uh, again, make that progress uh, in a way that kind of, you know, feels like you're maybe starting from a point now that might feel good or, or less good, but it's certainly gonna feel much better in the long run. And so again, all of these different areas uh, can certainly be considered. Uh, while I'm on this, I think maybe a few important areas, especially for younger dentists, you know, starting with things like uh, cash flow and goal planning, right? Thinking about what you really wanna achieve in the long term is great, not everybody knows, of course. Um, so just thinking even you know a few months ahead or a year ahead and saying, okay, well, what I love to do while I'm, you know, in my current state is um, create a budget so that I can at least, you know, afford to pay back student loans and afford to pay my, you know, general lifestyle, but has something left over to travel a bit, to start saving and investing a little bit. Um, and, you know, once that starts to build and progress, um, you know, each year it'll get easier and easier to do those kinds of more exciting things um, and work towards that. I definitely encourage everyone to, you know, at least start with thinking about, let me make sure I have, you know, enough kind of cash in the bank uh, for an emergency fund for a rainy day. You know, we generally say that something between three and six months of your mandatory expenses is a great baseline. But of course, it's up to you in the end. You know, I, it doesn't have to be kind of a cookie cutter comment like that. You know, be kind of honest with yourself and say, oh, well, if, if something were to happen to me, how much would I really need? Um, socked away in case I got injured, lost my job, whatever it is. And certainly things like insurance can help um, cover those things as well. But having something there is certainly important. And then from there, you, know, you certainly want to take advantage of you know, different kinds of savings options available to you that have an automatic you know, match or bonus, things like a 403B or 401k, where you might have some automatic, um, again, increase in your savings just by putting something in there. That can, again, be those retirement accounts. It might even be a health savings account. Um, or if you have kids, you know, you might look at something like a uh, dependent care account. And that kind of falls a bit more under tax planning. But certainly looking at the different types of tax advantage options for your savings. Again, it doesn't have to be massive, but every little bit helps, especially if it can reduce that tax bill on a year by year basis. And if it can grow in a more tax advantaged way over time, um, then you're really kind of, you know, looking forward towards that ultimate planning goal, which is reducing your kind of lifetime tax expenses and maximizing your savings and your investments. And then layering in things like um, insurance, right? Making sure you have things like malpractice, disability, covered life, you know, if you need life insurance, all those kinds of things, maximizing company benefits, start kind of building, you know, one step at a time towards these key areas um, up at the top here. Over time, other things will suddenly become more important Right, things like estate planning um, maybe aren't necessarily important for everyone right off the bat. But once, you know, maybe you're starting a family, or once you have um, assets where if if you were to pass, someone needs to take care of them, or you want to have something there, that can become important too. And these things get layered in gradually over time. Uh, so don't necessarily feel like you have to do everything at once. And then, of course, in the long term, many people eventually want to retire. Some much earlier than others. Some maybe not. Maybe it's not everybody. That's totally fine too. 
Um, and there's a lot of ways to, again, put all these things together. But I think the last thing I'll mention here is that all of these different areas um, intersect and have kind of interlocking and often um, very positive uh, cr cross benefits. And uh, what I mean by that is, for example, if you have student loans and maybe you're paying them back now on one of the income-based plans, if you have federal loans, um, the, the way the government calculates your payments is based on your income and the income is what's shown on your tax return. And if you save for retirement in something like a you know, tax advantage, traditional 401k or traditional IRA, um, if it's a pre-tax contribution, each dollar you make actually reduces your taxable income. And since your taxable income is going down, that may reduce your income-based student loan payments. And so there's little things like that where if, even if you're just saving a little bit in one area, it actually might make other areas like student loans, like cash flow that much easier. Now there's a whole, you know, several ways to save for things like retirement, just to name a few. Um, there are traditional accounts, like I just mentioned, you know, those are ones where you put something in and there's kind of an immediate tax benefit for making that contribution. There are Roth accounts too, where there's no immediate tax contribution, uh, tax benefit, but in both of them, the money that's in there will grow uh, tax deferred over time. And at the end, when you're kind of taking things out in retirement, Roth assets will come completely tax free to you, which is great. Uh, the same thing is true with other accounts like HSAs as well. But traditional, you know, they'll, since you already had a tax benefit, they'll become taxable to you in the long term. But depending on what kind of account you really want to choose, you know, I think that one concept that's super important is, again, with whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you can support, saving something and investing something early has really big payoffs in the long term. And this chart here is uh, one from a JP Morgan report, which is very interesting. And it basically shows four different scenarios of uh, someone who started early at age 25, they invested just $5,000 a year, every year consistently, and they invested it in a, a moderately diversified portfolio that earned 6% each year over time. And so over their you know, 40 year career, um, their $5,000 a year actually became $820,000 by the time they retired at age 65. And I won't go through all of these lines, but just to give you one other example, even just waiting 10 years, and sort of setting at 25, you started at 35, but did the exact same thing, save $5,000 a year every year and invested it in that same diversified portfolio, earning 6% a year on average. That person actually wound up with 419,000. So actually waiting 10 years, um, almost halved what they could have had in that portfolio. Now, of course, this is a hypothetical scenario. And of course, real, you know, real life doesn't matter. But like the point of this, this type of chart is to say that you know, starting at the habit early of being disciplined with you know, having your savings go into, again, some kind of vehicle that's designed for you know, a certain goal, long-term growth like this, maybe something shorter term like buying a house. The earlier you can start, even if it's just a little, just a little bit, uh, it all really adds up and it's certainly very helpful. Um, now, for different types of accounts that have tax advantages, I'll just touch on this very briefly, but the two most common ones for people are IRAs, which are individual retirement accounts, and 401ks or 403bs. You know, those are more company retirement accounts. Uh, those are always most commonly available to people when they're starting their career. But if you wind up um, choosing to be more entrepreneurial or go and join a practice or start your own practice, maybe other types of accounts that you can take advantage of later on, uh, and the biggest benefit of these other types of accounts, things like SEP IRAs, solo 401ks, and simple IRAs, as well as defined benefit pension plans, is that you can save at much higher levels. They have much higher maximum contribution uh, amounts that you can make each year. And of course, it's, it's worth talking with an advisor or an accountant about how best to take advantage and, and what options to choose for the different tax uh, benefits that you can gather from these types of things. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll mention that now, happy to provide more details uh, in the Q&A if that's of interest. Um, but I think I'll, I'll pause there because I want to make sure I leave time for uh, the other great speakers here as well. And again, uh, you know, the way we approach um, financial planning uh, for dentists, young dentists in general, is that we take a very you know, holistic approach towards both financial planning and investment management. Uh, we do so from a fiduciary standpoint. I think that's an important um, you know, point to make is that when you're getting this type of uh, advice from someone when it you know, concerns your, your whole finances like that, you know, whether you're talking to someone at our firm or somewhere else, uh, talking to a fiduciary really helps because you know, they're legally obligated, we are legally obligated to act in your best interest as opposed to our own or some, uh, some of our employers. Uh, so I certainly encourage everyone to 
you know, have a chat. Uh, if you're interested in chatting with us, uh, certainly feel free to reach out. Um, you can go to our website, altfest.com slash dentists, or you can reach out to uh, me directly or one of my colleagues. But with that, uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, happy to answer any questions during the Q&A, but I'll throw it back over to James for now. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much, you. Ben. Next, I will turn it over to Alex. Awesome. Thanks, James. And, and thanks, Ben, for, for leading us off. Um, I'm going to share a few slides here just for illustration purposes. Um, is that all right? It looks like I don't have uh, screen share capabilities. Uh, can I just give you the your co-host now, so you should be able to share it. All right, cool. Um, thank you, um, and, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, I know finances and, and especially student loan debt is, is probably nobody's favorite topic to discuss. Um, so thanks for taking some time. I think it is uh, well worth uh, the hour here to get a little bit of insight into uh, the holistic financial planning that Ben just talked about. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit more of the weeds here of student loan repayments. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave things off. I think really pertinent topic for everybody to acknowledge and, and understand is um, this CARES Act uh, interest and payment holiday that's been in, in effect since last March. Um, so in response to uh, the pandemic, um, part of the CARES Act, the original CARES Act, I know there's been a number since then, um, was to alleviate uh, the student loan burden um, on you know, millions of borrowers across the country. So um, as part of that CARES Act, uh, federal student loans um, have not charged you payments um, nor interest since last March. And originally that was supposed to end last September. It got extended through the end of 2020, got extended again through the end of uh, this January. And then one of the first things President Biden did when he took office was extended again through September 31st, 2021. So if you have a federal student loan, um, you have probably noticed by now, you have not had to make any payments, um, nor have you been charged interest on that loan. So uh, unprecedented as with uh, many uh, facets of the world in the last you know, 12 months here, um, but your, your student loans, federal student loans, um, have been costing you nothing since then. And a great benefit, um, especially for any dentists out there who are working at a nonprofit, is that these months of you know, zero dollar payments um, count as progress towards public service loan forgiveness. So I'm sure you're all familiar with public service loan forgiveness where you, you know, if you worked at a nonprofit or government entity for 10 years, um, making qualifying payments during those years, if there's anything remaining, it gets forgiven as part of this program. Um, so these 18 months um, under the CARES Act with $0 payments and, and zero interest um, counts as progress towards uh, loan forgiveness. So nice benefit there for anybody working at a nonprofit or government entity. Uh, more info um, on the, the COVID federal response can be found at the URL at the bottom of the screen, but suffice to say it, it's, it's been much needed relief for many around the country. Um, you know, not asking you to, to make payments on, on your student loan debt, nor charging you interest. So it's not as though the loan is growing, um, you know, during, during that time. Um, so I wanted to leave things off of that. I probably should have started a little bit about uh, Laurel Road. Um, so we are uh, the endorsed student loan refinance provider of the ADA. Um, basic idea is, you know, many folks are not utilizing any of the federal uh, repayment programs and um, especially dentists, you know, incentivized um, to refinance to try and pay back the loan as quickly as possible with as little interest as possible. That's your goal. And, and that's what we do at Laurel Road is we pay off your existing loan. We give you a new loan at a lower interest rate. The trade-off is this is now a private student loan versus um, what most people have coming out of school, which is a federal student loan. Um, and so I, I wanted to just sort of level set and make sure everybody is you know, cognizant of the differences between a private refinanced loan and a federal loan, which is what you probably have right now. 
So I'll just kind of run through some similarities and differences between the two. Um, federal loans, yeah, you can get a repayment term as long as 30 years. A Laurel Road refinance loan, we have repayment terms 5, 7, 10, 15, and 20 years. So um, not as long a term option, but we have some shorter term options um, for those who want to pay back the loan quicker. I think the one of the biggest differences um, is the interest rate. So federal student loans, everybody gets the same rate uh, for whatever given year you're in school, um, whether you're you know a dentist at one school, a dentist at another school, a you know art history major at another school, everybody's getting the same rate in that given year uh, on federal loans. If you were to refinance your loan with a private lender like Laurel Road, um, we base your rate on your credit worthiness. Um, so we're looking at things like your credit score, your total debt, your total income um, to determine how likely are you to pay this loan back? That's, that's really what credit worthiness is a measure of. Um, how likely are you to, to pay the debt back? So the more credit worthy you are, the lower your interest rate is going to be. Um, and, and generally, you know, our typical rate is in the four-ish percent range, um, especially if not lower uh, in the current interest rate environment. Typical federal loan rate, you know, outside of this CARES Act uh, interest holiday is six to seven percent. So there's a, a pretty good difference there if you were to refinance. The things that you give up when you refinance are um, some of these, you know, niche federal repayment programs like income-driven repayments, public service loan forgiveness, um, you know, the opportunity to have loans forgiven, you know, either working at a nonprofit or by paying based on your income for, you know, 20 or 25 years. So if you're in that uh, bucket and you're, you're looking to get your loan debt forgiven through, you know, some federal program, refinancing would not be in your best interest. But if you're somebody who's sitting there saying, you know, I, I know I'm going to pay this all back out of my own pocket. I just want to do so as you know economically as possible with as little interest as possible. Refinancing is often a, a good outlet to do so. Um, so uh, I guess very high level, you're trading some of those federal programs, federal flexibilities for a lower refinanced interest rate. Some of the other ways we differ, um, and generally, you know, a, a Laurel Road refinance or any private loan is going to be a little bit less flexible than a federal loan. So, length of forbearance um, is less than on a federal loan. We do not offer in-school deferment. We offer 12 months of forbearance, but not in-school deferment. So, if you thought you might go back to school, you would not want to refinance um, your student loans, um, as as we don't offer the opportunity to not make payments while you're in school. Uh, similarly, uh, the default timeline is shorter on a private loan than, than it would be on a federal loan. And the real big difference, especially right now, is the interest and payment holiday you're seeing on federal loans. That's not offered on private loans um, at the moment. So as we're not the federal government, we're not able to just put all loan payments and interest on hold. Um, but keep in mind, that's due to come to an end at the end of September. Um, we're expecting a lot of people are kind of holding out on refinancing until uh, we get closer to that September point. Um, but with rates being as low as they are, we're also seeing some folks um, look to refinance now, lock in the low rate for the, the life of the loan. Um, and the rest of the items on here are ways that we are identical to federal loans. So still discharged in the event of death or disability, um, still eligible for student loan interest tax deduction um, on your federal taxes, still categorized as a student loan on your tax report and same interest capitalization um, while in forbearance. So we've tried to mirror the federal programs as much as possible, but um, ultimately there are some you know, significant differences. Um, it's, it's really a personal choice you know, do you want to stick with some of the federal flexibilities or, you know, are you comfortable paying back the loan and you just want to focus on, you know, getting as low an interest rate as possible? Um, so just a couple added benefits of refinancing. I mentioned the low rates. Obviously, that equates to savings over the life of the loan. You know, a typical dentist, you know, who had 200000 plus of student loan debt 
if you remove this, you know, current situation we're in come September and said, you've got a federal loan at 7% or you could refinance, uh, you know, to a, uh, a Laurel Road private loan at four or 5%, that two or 3% difference typically is equating to, you know, 15 to 20 to $25,000 in savings over the life of the loan as a result of that lower rate. Um, and, and what's really nice is you'll be able to choose what term you look to pay the loan back on. So we have, again, five, seven, 10, 15, and 20 years. Um, you'll be able to choose a term that kind of fits your budget. Obviously, shorter term loans are going to have a higher payment, um, but they'll be done quicker with less interest. Longer term loans are going to have a lower payment, so a little bit more liquidity. Um, you know, that, that decision is probably something you want to talk to somebody like Ben about, um, you know, what, what fits best in your overall financial plan. Um, so I get asked all the time, when is the best time to refinance? And there is nobody on earth who can tell you uh, the, the optimal refinancing time. What I can say is we are currently in a historically low interest rate environment. Um, the 10-year treasury is nearly 0%. We've started to tick back up a little bit um, just in the last month or two. Um, so, you know, rates are about as low as you will ever have seen in your lifetime. Um, obviously, the CARES Act complicates things right now, but if you had a private loan, sort of a no-brainer to look to refinance, lock in a lower rate right now. Um, but certainly as we get closer to September, you know, those federal loans, assuming you're not going to pursue one of the federal uh, forgiveness or income-driven repayment programs, um, really a good time to look at you know, locking in a lower rate for the, the remaining duration of your repayment. Um, so that was all I had uh, in terms of content. Um, happy to answer questions as, as at, at the end of the presentation today, um, but big thanks to uh, New York State Dental Association for organizing this and, and including us. Um, you know, I guess one takeaway is uh, everyone should understand there's no one size fits all approach to loan repayments. Um, your colleague next to you, you know, may be looking to refinance or pursue forgiveness, um, but that's not necessarily the best, you know, repayment approach for your situation. So do your own research, you know, consult with uh, financial planners, uh, financial advisors, uh, read information on the internet. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity out there to reduce the cost of your debt. So make sure you're, you're taking advantage of those opportunities. Thank you, Alex. And I will turn it over to Gina to wrap us up before questions. And actually, if I, oh, perfect. I guess uh, we can't, Gina, can, are you, she might be having a few technical difficulties. In the meantime, actually, there's a couple questions in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Can oh, you hear me? Perfect. Yeah. Oh, Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thanks, uh, Dr. Wanamaker. I um, wanted to just start off by saying I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with new dentists, especially in the area of how insurance fits into a solid financial plan. Um, and one thing uh, that we started off with, at least in the introduction, I like the way it was described as a defensive um, plan or part of your financial planning. And it really is, especially in the context of life insurance and disability insurance, which is what I'll cover in my 10 minutes. Um, but in general, I think it's always helpful to equate the idea that if you have something of value to lose, you have something important to protect. And in this case, especially for young dentists, new dentists, I think it's to say your earning potential as a dentist is substantial, probably is an understatement, it, it, but it's definitely an important asset. Certainly one you've expended great effort and time as well as expense to achieve. So with that in mind, I'd like to focus on the top three ways you can use life and disability insurance as part of your financial plan throughout your career. Um, number one, probably the most important from my perspective is uh, disability insurance. And that's also income protection. 
And when you think of that insurance, especially as a dentist, you really want to consider um, own occupation coverage. And that may be a term you've heard, probably heard it even in dental school, but it basically is simple in that it provides you with coverage and benefits if you're unable to work in your own special area of practice in dentistry. And it really shouldn't take into account any consideration of whether you're able to work in some other occupation or even within some other area of practice. So um, just by way of background, I am a, um, or at least by training, I'm a lawyer, but my background is in the area of disability claims and medical underwriting within the insurance industry. And one thing I enjoy sharing with new dentists about my experience, and I have 20 plus years of working with disabled dentists, is just how surprising it was for me to learn from a real work experience or practical experience, how physically demanding dentistry is. And I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but that that really is the reason you need coverage, at least part of your insurance coverage in your insurance portfolio should cover you solely in your own occupation and never take into account your ability to work in some other field. And it's worth emphasizing um, that in the context of purchasing your disability insurance. Also, especially with this one, more so even than life insurance, I would say you really should think about obtaining your insurance as early as you can, as early as practically feasible, because when you get own occupation and coverage, it's from an underwriting perspective, there are things that even as a healthy person may make you uninsurable or may reduce your ability to obtain insurance on an own occupation basis without some limitation. So let's just say, for example, if you've had a some kind of musculoskeletal injury or um, f fracture, let's say, that might be an area where you might have to have a, a waiver or that would prevent you from getting the amount of coverage you want from an own occupation standard. So I would look at that as early as you can and obtain as much of the coverage that you need to protect your income on an own occupation basis. Um, and then the next number two is loan collateral, using insurance as loan collateral. And I think in that case, you may, most people probably think of life insurance, but again, you really want to keep in mind how uh, disability insurance works in that context as well. In this area, your, um, whether you're thinking about uh, purchasing a practice or expanding your practice with a new office or just purchasing equipment, um, most lenders are gonna be interested in more than the underlying asset for collateral, especially since it's not as valuable without you in the practice. Seeing patients <laughs> and treating your patients, it really um, starts to, I think, uh, diminish in value quite a bit if the dentist is out of the office. So in this case, um, even a small amount of life insurance, even around 100,000, which really isn't much, can go a long way in providing the debt pro uh, protection needed to close a practice loan. And, and more important, I think, is the disability insurance. Even 2,000 to 4,000 per month, which if you think about it from an income protection perspective, really, doesn't sound like that would cut it, <laughs> but it can go a long way to close a loan in terms of just a practice loan or a, a purchase of a equipment. So again, here, own occupation coverage is critical because you, if you're not able to work in dentistry in your office, that's when you need that coverage to kick in and, and pay the collateral assignee. And then the, the last area I'd like to cover is succession planning. And this is um, really a little bit more uh, heavy on the life insurance side and where you might need uh, much more than um, a small amount of insurance, more than 100,000 likely. But this is something you might think about if you're um, in a partnership or thinking about um, joining a partnership and it's used almost always to fund buy-sell agreements. So the, the way it works is if you have two partners in a practice, let's say, um, each partner would own a life insurance policy on the life of the other. And then in the event, the death of their partner, the um, life insurance would be collected and used to purchase 
the deceased partner's share of the practice. So that, um, that can be really important, especially in a, in a partnership. But um, it's, not, it's not really the only insurance you use for that. I, I know in working with consultants over the years that oftentimes they like office overhead expense coverage as well. So in the event um, of a disability of their partner, they can collect expenses um, to cover their share of the practice expenses while at a time when they're not generating revenues or income. So in that case, again, the key word of the day is own occupation coverage because you really need that to pick up, pick up and pay in the event of um, your inability to, to work in dentistry. And I think that's that's it. That's the three key areas I wanted to cover. And then I'd like to uh, answer any questions the group has through the Q&A. Perfect, that's great. We actually do have a couple questions. Uh, the first question is for Ben. Um, what is a reasonable fee that they should expect um, or anticipate for a fee-based uh, fiduciary advisor? Uh, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I, I would say that, you know, generally speaking, uh, most comprehensive wealth managers fall into one of three categories. Either they charge on a percent of the assets that they're managing, um, which is called percent of AUM. And if that's the case, and that's probably the most common uh, setup, one uh, percent or so, right, give or take a bit, depending on, um, you know, their fee schedule uh, is about the industry norm. Um, there are a lot of financial planners who actually take more of a um, flat fee basis, either with an annual retainer, almost kind of like hiring a lawyer, but going to have a, a flat fee per year. Um, there's a wide range of what that covers. You know, very very high end financial planners with, with, who focus on very complex situations might charge ten thousand or more per year. Um, people who focus on more simple situations might charge four or five thousand or less per year. That's a pretty wide range there. And then there's also hourly financial planners. Um, and again, there's a range, uh, but that's more based on if you have a couple questions and you just want one thing answered, but you want to pay someone to do it, an hourly situation might work. For what we do at Altfest, it's typically uh, the first category. We typically charge about 1% of AUM. It goes down, of course, over certain thresholds of the assets that we're managing. Um, but what we do is for young professionals specifically, we have a dedicated program uh, just for uh, that client base, that group, and essentially there's there's no minimum for an investment uh, threshold um, what we do is we kind of start with the assumption that no matter you know, if, if there's any investments great we're happy to go right to the kind of one percent or so of aum again give or, give or take but what we do is have a first year uh, minimum fee of about two thousand five hundred dollars essentially because a lot of the financial planning um, work is front loaded often uh, in that first year first 12 months and then it drops down after that so that's that's our structure, but certainly there's uh, a range, um, and we're by no means the cheapest or most expensive uh, option out there. There is a question for you. Then. Um, if this one, I don't know who it's actually from, but is investing in a IRA account yearly? Would it be wiser to use the backdoor Roth or keep the money in the IRA long term when thinking about withdrawing in retirement at retirement age? What are the advantages of keeping the money in the IRA versus transferring them? via backdoor to a Roth IRA? Yeah, that's a good question. Really interesting one. Um, and, and in case anyone who's not familiar with that um, uh, terminology uh, isn't aware for, again, like I mentioned earlier, for any kind of IRA and for many kind of 401ks, there's really two options. There's traditional and there's Roth. With a traditional IRA, um, typically you're getting a immediate tax deduction or reduction of your taxable income when you make a contribution in that year. The money that's in there is invested and it grows tax deferred. You don't have to pay any capital gains or taxes on your income that you're making in that account. But when you retire and you start taking money out, the money you receive, um, and you're actually forced to take it out at some point, that comes back to you as ordinary income, as if it's a salary. And so, you know, if you're in a very high tax bracket now um, and you might be in a lower tax bracket in the future, that would be a, a great way to kind of say, oh, great, well, I, I want to get my advantages. Well, my tax rate is high, and then I'm happy to pay you know, taxes at the back end when my tax rate might be lower. If you're in the opposite situation, which of course many young dentists are, their income tax bracket is probably lower now than it will be later on in life, then a Roth um, account might make more sense. You get no immediate benefit from the contributions, but 
um, in a Roth account, the investments grow uh, tax-free forever. The, the withdrawals you take out of a Roth account are also not taxed. Um, and this uh, question here is really talking about whether you want to kind of have something in your traditional IRA, if you've been doing that regularly, that's fantastic. Um, or whether it's better to start using a Roth IRA, uh, which actually can make sense. There's this concept of tax diversification, so having a bit of um, Roth assets and traditional assets actually can make sense because of course, we don't know what's gonna happen with tax rates or tax policy in the future. Um, you know, Tax rates were lowered three or four years ago, they may be raised again at some point in the future. Anyone's guess is what's gonna happen four decades from now. Um, and so that there's that concept to consider uh, immediately, but also specifically in this question is the concept of a backdoor Roth IRA contribution. And what that's getting at is um, when you're putting money into an IRA specifically, if you make over a certain threshold of income, depending on whether you're single or married, it's either 130,000 ish or 190,000 ish. If you make more than that amount in a given year, you cannot um, contribute directly to a Roth IRA. And if you make over, again, certain thresholds and you have access to a workplace retirement plan like a 401k or a 403b, you can make contributions to a traditional IRA, but if you make too much money, you actually may not get that upfront benefit. So what many people do if they wanna you know, save more aggressively for retirement is they'll put the annual maximum into a traditional IRA, currently at $6,000. Um, they'll make what's called a non-deductible contribution, meaning you forego the upfront benefit of the contribution, but then they'll very shortly after making that contribution, they'll transfer it to a Roth IRA where it will then stay and grow tax-free forever. So that is the backdoor uh, Roth contribution. Put something in traditional, convert it to Roth, let it grow. Um, that is a very good technique, no question. I'm definitely a big proponent of it. Um, I, I basically try to tell as many people as I can about it because it's great. Um, again, it's a bit more advanced. Yes, it's fully legal. I, I know there's kind of questions just like, why would the government say you can't contribute to a Roth, but then you can if you do this weird backdoor method Been around for decades. Congress is kind of, uh, I, I guess, let it happen for so long and they're kind of fine with it. But either way, um, the one caveat really to, to be aware of with doing that is that if you have assets in a traditional IRA and it's a lot, or even it's a medium amount, then if you're putting 6,000 in and then transferring it over to the Roth, it's not necessarily a completely tax-free transaction. If you have absolutely no traditional assets and you do this, there's no taxes, period. However, if you already have traditional assets in an IRA and you do a backdoor Roth conversion, there's this law called the pro rata rule, which says that that $6,000, some portion of it might be subject to tax. Because typically speaking, if you're taking a traditional dollar and converting it into a Roth dollar, since it's leaving a traditional account, you have to then pay taxes as if it was ordinary income, just as if you were in retirement. So there's just that one caveat to be aware of if that applies to you definitely talk to your accountant about what it might mean for you or talk to your planner about whether it's worth doing or not. Um, all of this is definitely a good idea, but certainly can be more beneficial for people who are younger or earlier in their career and may not be worthwhile for people later in their, in their career. Or it can be uh, a much broader discussion about um, a tax rate arbitrage, depending on what stage of pre-retirement you might be in. I'll leave that for a future conversation because otherwise we'll be here for four more hours. But I'll stop there. Great, that's a good, that's a lot of information. But um, this other question is for Alex. Is there a cost to refinancing your student loan or a limit of how many times you can refinance? There's not. Um, so it's it's totally cost-free to refinance. Um, we don't charge any origination fees, application fees, closing costs. Um, and, and there is no limit on the amount of times you refinance. So especially in the current rate environment, we're seeing plenty of people who have refinanced with, you know, not only just other lenders, but even Laurel Road in the past, um, look to re refinance again and, and lock in an even lower rate right now uh, with rates being so low. That's a good question. That's all I have right now in the queue. Are there any other questions that folks might have? Um, you can send them in the chat. I mean, at this point, we have a few more minutes. Uh, if anybody else wants to add anything or just wants to unmute and, and ask their question. Um, if a question pops up at any time after this session, you know, we'll uh, are more than happy to 
um, for them onto the speakers. We at NISDA will be sending out an email after this with a great tip sheet, um, contact information for all of our speakers today at their um, respective locations. And they are always um, more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, if there's anything, I, I can kick it off to James if you wanted to add any more closing remarks or if there's anything the speakers wanna add before we head off. I think all of this was excellent. Uh, there are some good questions, a lot of great info here that is all very helpful to all of us new dentists out there. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, if you wanted the CE credit, make sure you quickly change your name um, listing on Zoom here so that we can get your names to get you the CE credit. And if we don't have any more questions, uh, we'll get all wrapped up then. I did want to encourage folks to consider registering for the last part of the four-part series. Um, and I will be sending out emails for that information as well after this session too. Awesome. Thanks for adding that in, Grazia. Perfect. And thank you again to all of our speakers and everyone who came out tonight.